Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to the last lecture of uh, NLP, Natural Language Processing. So today, uh, I plan to give you an overview of uh, question answering and uh, chat box. And this is going to be a high level overview uh, with uh, steps and some ideas. We won't be able to go into details. Uh, for those who want to uh, look into the details, they can look into the chapters of the textbook, chapter 23 and 24, respectively. Ch chapter 23 is on question answering, and chapter 24 is on uh, chatbots, chatbots and uh, dialogue, dialogue agents. And uh, of course, uh, both of these areas are active areas of research, so you can always uh, find more recent work on the web. Uh, you can search for recent papers and find what others are doing in this area. So uh, that would be the main agenda for today. Uh, so since this is the last lecture, uh, a couple of things that we need to discuss, uh, the project deadline, for example, we need to uh, fix a date. Your exam is on May 3 uh, from 3 to 6 p.m. The format of the exam would be similar to that that you saw in the midterm. So there will be two parts, a part A, which would be on LMS, and a part B that you would have to do uh, using pen and paper. And uh, I think both exams should be done in about two hours or two hours, 15 minutes. Uh, the content uh, would be post mid primarily, but some concepts concepts would uh, continue from pre mid uh, concepts like uh, language modeling concepts, for example, primarily. Of course, we wouldn't be testing you for uh, the n-gram estimation models, but the basic idea of probabilities and, uh, and uh, language modeling should continue to later chapters as well. Uh, so of course, uh, night base and stuff like that also would, would not be covered in the post mid. Uh, so, but other things that are continuation from the previous would be kind of covered uh, implicitly. So I'll be sending out a detailed syllabus later on. So you can uh, look at that as well. So, uh, regarding the project, uh, I'm planning to have uh, your uh, final deliverable by May 1. So May 1, I think it's a Saturday. And there is also going to be a presentation slash demo. Uh, I'm still undecided on how to do this. Uh, so one idea is that we should have a very short uh, session for each group, five minutes, maybe three or four slides maximum uh, that gives the problem setting and the results on the, no long discussion on introduction, motivation and stuff like that. Uh, the problem setting and what you have done in terms of the model and the results. So that would also then be on May 1, but this would, take about, I think, two hours or two and a half hours for, I think, the 12 groups that you are out there. So, so, so in general, you should target a deadline on May 1 for your project. Okay. So any questions? So the main deliverable, of course, is your final report. The final report should be written like uh, a paper. It should have introduction, it should have motivation, uh, it should discuss a related work and build up the model that you're trying to implement. It should then discuss the methodology, the model. It should then discuss the data sets and the experiments that you have done. Discuss, the, discuss and present the results as well as any insights and conclusions that you can draw from your results. So 
So the report should be professionally written. And of course, its weightage is also high. I think 60% of the entire project is based on the final report. All right. Um, Any questions? So, uh, so as I said, uh, I will provide a quick overview of uh, two topics which are kind of related. Uh, one is question answering and the second is uh, chatbots or conversational agents. So question answering is of course chapter Chapter 23 of your textbook by Jurovsky. Uh, so what exactly is question answering? So question answering is basically uh, the task of so some automated system that can give you answers to your specific questions, give answers to your specific questions. And the questions, of course, are uh, communicated in natural language. It, they might be speech or it could be text. And the answers also, of course, are in natural language and they could also be in speech or text. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, if you only process with text, speech generation is uh, quite easy. So most of the processing or analysis is done in the textual format. So if you have any text, you can have a text-to-speech engine that would convert that text into high quality speech. So generating speech from text is not difficult. Uh, and of course, processing information in the textual format is much more easier. Uh, the input as text uh, would typically also be converted into, so input, speech as speech would also typically be converted into text. So that is of course speech recognition. The so speech recognition is uh, primarily uh, NLP, but with signal processing. So this is something that we did not talk about in this course, but this also is fairly well developed now. So for uh, resource rich languages, speech recognition is quite good. So I think you're all familiar with uh, Google Assistant and maybe even Alexa. So Alexa and Google Assistant do a very good job in understanding your speech. Uh, of course, Google Assistant now also understands Urdu also, by the way. So, so it, for English, of course, it does a very good job. And uh, in the back end, it will convert your speech into text and then does all the processing and text generates the new communication element in text and then that text is converted into speech again using text to speech. Okay, so we were talking about question answering. So question answering has a question of course, which is in natural language. And then you need to generate an answer, which is also in natural language. So of course, when you have a question, you do need to do natural language understanding. So you need to understand the question. And when you want to generate an answer, you need to do natural language generation, of course. And that generation should be conditioned on the question that is asked in the uh, question. Okay. So you're also, I think you're familiar with the question answering also, I think nowadays we have Google Assistant as well as even in Google search box, if you ask any question, it will give you the answer. So that is what we are talking about. And to be more specific, we are more concerned with factoid question answering. 
or factual factoid probably not the right word so so you you might have a question like who won the icc uh, world cup uh, who is the current world cup champion for example so this is a question written in natural language and as an answer you need a single output so for example australia so question answering understanding the question and giving the exact answer as output or it could be presented in more uh, natural language like australia is the current icc champion So, so how, how do we go about doing this? Uh, so I'm just going to give you some uh, broad ideas. Traditionally, uh, we have what is known as rule-based systems. So rules, of course, were primarily developed by humans and they were looking for uh, let me know. I think I will not cover this. I'll cover this later. So actually, there are um, two broad categories of approaches. One is called IR based, which is IR stands for information retrieval based, and the second is the knowledge based. So knowledge base implies that you are, you are kind of querying some structured database to answer the question. While in IR, you are trying to retrieve documents. IR is primarily about retrieving documents like web pages uh, or other documents. And then from those documents, you try to answer the question. So these are the two main categories of approaches. So IR, uh, we did not discuss in detail in this course, but uh, the general idea in IR is you have a query, which of course is a sequence of words. And uh, this is usually short. So you need to have this represented in some way. So traditional representation could be like TF-IDF, for example. And then you have a collection of documents in D. Of course, this is, I'm writing as one document, one query, but there is usually a collection of documents. For example, if you're searching the web, uh, the collection of documents will be the entire documents on the web. And the small Q, one query is one query that you put into the Google search box. Okay. So in order to process both of these, of course, the document is also a sequence of words. Query is a sequence of words, document is a sequence of words. So in order to process both of these, you need to have proper representation. So the traditional representation was the vectorial, or this is the most common representation. The traditional was sparse, which was bag of words using weighing scheme like TF-IDF, okay? So you represented Q as a vector, you represented D as a vector, and since uh, you're using uh, you're using a sparse representation or vectorial representation, you need to have a fixed vector length. So that vector length is equal to the vocabulary size. So once you have that, then you can find the similarity between a query and a document by our common cosine similarity. So basically the cosine between Q and D. And of course you will do it for all the Ds. And of course, based on that, you can rank the D and then output the ranked output. Output ranked list of docs. Okay. Of course, there are some other uh, steps in between in general, we do a scoring of the document. So here the scoring was based primarily on the cosine similarity, but usually scoring is more involved. 
it also looks at other things like where does a particular word in the query occurs in the document? Does it occur in the heading of the document? Does it occur in the body of the document? Is there, uh, for example, is the topic of the document represented in the query? Or for example, if it's a web page, if the word occurs as part of the anchor text or not. So all of those things may be considered to generate a score. And then that score is then used to rank the documents. So obviously uh, our query in this case was a question. So, and question could have been written in natural language. So oftentimes you will need to process the query. So query processing is sometimes also done. And in the case of question answering, we will be more interested in uh, determining exactly what the uh, user is asking. So, so, and usually uh, words like verbs and nouns would be of interest. Of course, this is a very simplistic view, but you can have more sophisticated techniques that, uh, for example, entities also, we need to find entities in the query. So that would give us idea what is being asked. And then maybe you want to find the relationships between what are between the entities and what is being asked. So in other words, you can think of the, what is the intent or purpose of using those entities. So of course there are multiple ways of doing this. I'm just giving you a high picture, uh, bird's eye view you can say. So at the very lowest level, you can just think of those as words, represent them as vectors, that's it. But if you want to go deeper, you will have to do query understanding, natural language understanding. And that could include very simple things like part of speech tagging, it could be more sophisticated like entity recognition. It could be more sophisticated like parsing, trying to identify the relationship between the entities or trying to understand uh, broader concepts that are uh, present in the query. And then of course, trying to identify deeper uh, intents within the query. So all of these would typically, or most of these would typically be done through machine learning, through techniques that we have studied that nowadays mostly are neural network based. Okay. So traditionally uh, queries were also expanded. Query expansion was also a common technique and which is, but not very popular for question answering. It is more popular for general IR. So what is query expansion? Maybe you have written some uh, keywords, but there may be other keywords that are similar to those keywords. So those keywords would be added into your query in the back end just to expand the query and make sure that the matching with the documents becomes better. So, I don't know, I mean, you can think of uh, examples like, so for example, if someone is searching cricket and uh, let's say match, for example. So cricket of course is also an animal an insect. So by, but you seeing the word match would kind of disambiguate that cricket is actually uh, the sports. So maybe expansion might include words like sports uh, into the keywords in the query so that the query would match better with the documents. So this is the general idea of query expansion. Try to I enhance the list of keywords that are present in the uh, query. And then of course, at the end of the day, we need to develop a representation. Okay. So 
the traditional representation, as I said, was sparse. But nowadays, dense representations are also common. So dense representation means the representations that are developed through, for example, word to vec or even bird, for example. Bird, of course, would be contextual representation. So let's say the case of bird, how would this work? So let's say you have a query Q. So you'll pass this query through BERT. A BERT, of course, a pre-trained language model. So you will pass this query through BERT and get a sentence get a sentence embedding, for example, from the CLS token of the this particular uh, sequence of words in the query. So similarly, similarly, you can pass D into BERT and get a doc representation. So now you have a dense representation for both Q and D, and then again, use the cosine for similarity and then do the ranking and rank. So this would kind of take care of some of the issues of exact matching that is a problem with the sparse representation. Here, since you are using embeddings, synonyms and other uh, similar words may be catered through the embedding representation. Okay. So, so this was IR, but remember we were trying to do a factual uh, question answering. So, and so usually IR would give you a full unit as a retrieved unit. That unit can be a full document, but we want to answer that question with just a small answer, like the question I asked before, who won the World Cup, Cricket World Cup, the answer is Australia, just one word. So usually IR would give you a unit, which minimally might be a, a paragraph, but usually a document. So how do you determine that exact phrase you can say that answers the question from a paragraph? So that part is then called uh, in general, reading comprehension. So you must have uh, studied English in O level and A level or FSE. So you were typically given a passage and from that passage, you were asked some questions. So that was reading comprehension. You had questions and the answer to those questions existed in the passage but it was your job to find out exactly where in the passage that answer was. But now we would like to automate that. The same idea here. We have found the document through IR. Now through an automated reading comprehension approach, we would like to find the answer to that question. So this is the second part for QA. The first part was primarily IR. So how is this done? Uh, again, modern techniques are neural network based. And again, using the example of BERT. So what we, we have a query, which is our question. And let's say we have a document or paragraph in which the question or the document which is retrieved by the IR system as having the answer to this particular question, okay? So what you can do is you can pass both of these into BERT. So now you have another BERT. So of course you have a CLS token, you have all the queues, you have SP token, and then you have <clears throat> all the words in document D and then of course SP again. You are feeding this into BERT, okay? So Q, K, Q has multiple tokens, D has multiple tokens. Of course, CLS is one token, SCP is one token. So this sequence is fed into BERT. And what we are trying to get is, <clears throat> for each, 
for the words in D, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is kind of breaking today. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so let's say your document D, uh, there would be multiple words in it. So let's say W1, W2, to let's say WM. So for each of these tokens in this document, uh, BERT has an output, which of course is appropriately attentioned through all the other words. Uh, we will now pass each of these words through a classification layer, a feed forward layer, and then a classification layer. And for each of these words, for each word, we output two, uh, or we do, we perform two classifications. So one is uh, is the word the start of the answer, and the second is the word the end of the answer. So in other words, for each uh, word, we get two probabilities, probability of W, or sorry, probability of start given some word W and probability of end given W for each word. So for each word, you have a probability attached with it or two probabilities attached with it. One is the starting probability or start probability. The other is the end probability. The start probability tells us uh, how likely is this word the start of the phrase that is an answer to this question, Q. And the, the other probability and probably tells us how likely is this the end of the phrase that is the answer to this question. So based on this, of course, these probabilities would be for all the words in the document D. So based on this, you can find the best, best sequence of words in D that answer the query, okay? So you can, so if you do some a kind of a greedy search, so you start with the word which has a maximum start probability, and then look for the uh, look for the word after that that has a maximum stop probability or end probability. So the words from this start to that end would then be the phrase or answer to this question. And of course, you will have to train this. So this is supervised. So you need to have some training corpus where you have already labeled a start and end. Uh, there is one other scenario. So let's say our IR system did not do a good job and the D does not contain the answer. So that can happen, right? So, and of course, if you pass this Q and D into the bird, all words would get some probabilities uh, for start and end, and you might generate a uh, sequence, uh, a span of words, a sequence of words for the answer, but that would not be correct because this document did not contain the answer. So for that, you can use the CLS token and its output for Uh, can you ask the question again? Because I think someone who bears a question, put it Sir, I, I am asking that in this output, there will be at least two uh, words. Honge, at least, come say come. Output will be two words. Honge. Okay, sir. Information retrieval. Me, I was telling you, starting will be probability max. Ha. Ki lega. 
जरूरी नहीं है दो वर्ड लेट से जो स्टार्टिंग प्रॉबेबिलिटी जिसकी ज्यादा थी उसी की एंड प्रॉबेबिलिटी भी ज्यादा हो सकती है बिकॉज ये दो सेपरेट क्लासीफायर हैं दो सेपरेट आपके फीड फॉरवर्ड या क्लासीफायर वर्ड के आगे लगे हुए हैं एक हर वर्ड की स्टार्टिंग प्रॉबेबिलिटी बता रहा है दूसरा हर वर्ड की एंड प्रॉबेबिलिटी बता रहा है सो सर लेट्स से कि जो स्टार्टिंग प्रॉबेबिलिटी है वो ही एंडिंग प्रॉबेबिलिटी है तो दैट विल यील्ड ओनली वन आउटपुट नहीं लेट मी सी सो फॉर एग्जांपल फॉर एनी वर्ड लेट्स से कोई वर्ड है ऑस्ट्रेलिया था लेट्स से वर्ड था ठीक है ना तो इसकी स्टार्टिंग प्रोबेबिलिटी लेट्स से आ रही है 0.5 ठीक है लेट्स से इसी की एंडिंग प्रोबेबिलिटी लेट्स से 0.6 आ रही है कोई प्रोबेबिलिटी तो आएगी ना सो लेट्स से स्टार्ट पॉइंट फाइव हमारे पास मैक्सिमम था और फिर पॉइंट सिक्स हमने इससे आगे देखने शुरू किया मे बी लेट से लेटर ऑन सारी जो प्रोबेबिलिटी ऑस्ट्रेलिया के बाद जो आ रही हैं वो पॉइंट सिक्स से कम है इसका मतलब है कि पॉइंट फाइव पॉइंट सिक्स हम इधर ही रुक जाएंगे यही मेरा एक वर्ड होगा आउटपुट का ओके सर डू गेट दिस यस सर आई गॉट इट uh okay so the other thing that i was talking about was that let's say if the answer is not there of course your model would still give some probability let's say koi point 3 probability i or point 4 probability i but of course you can maybe threshold on the probability but often times we don't have a good way of thresholding probabilities so one other way is that you use the cls token and its output for classifying whether this d contains an answer to q or not so kind of a binary classifier so use cls for binary classification whether this d contains an answer to this q theek okay? hai so this is the answer that we are trying to get out of this classification module and this would be from the cls token why the cls token the cls token would have information from all the q's words and all the d words okay and based on that we make a decision whether uh an answer exist for this query in the document or not okay so this is the span uh, span uh, or sequence or you can say the reading comprehension problem one way of solving the reading comprehension problem okay where you have a query and you assume that the answer exists in the document d and then you want to label the span from which uh, in the document that is the answer to this query okay so of course as i said you have to train this you will have to train this using some label data set okay so that was a uh, question answering and of course there are many other things uh, that can be discussed but i think uh, i think that is uh, enough as an introduction okay so the next part was uh, of course this was ir based the next part was knowledge based so in knowledge based uh, qa we assume that a knowledge base exist and a knowledge base generally is structured uh so it could be a relational database it could be some other uh, semantic database like the semantic triplets for example so we assume or it could be a knowledge graph for example so knowledge graph has nodes and edges 
and nodes may represent entities, edges may represent various relationships between those edges, uh, between those nodes. So several uh, knowledge graphs or knowledge bases exist. One knowledge base, which is slightly unstructured, of course, is still structured, is, which is very popular is, of course, the Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is an example of a knowledge base. And then, of course, there are many more structured knowledge bases available out there. Uh, you can uh, uh, search the web and find many. Of course, some of them are domain specific as well. For example, they might be a knowledge base for the medical domain. It might be a knowledge base for computer science and so on. So, so I think I uh, wouldn't be able to go deeper here because of course this whole area of knowledge based uh, techniques are somewhat more involved uh, and we, won't, we have not covered any aspect of this before. So, so just to give uh, a quick example, so let's say we have a, a common database in NLP, which is called a triplets. And of course, triplets could be in different forms. One form is the subject, and you have some predicate, and then you have the object. So, so subject could be, for example, the question I, that, I talked about is let's say ICC champion. I would say just ICC. So this is the subject and predicates could be various things based on this subject. So it could be, for example, current champion. So this is a predicate. And then the answer would basically answer this uh, assertion uh, for this subject and this predicate, which of course, let's say is Australia. Okay. So, so one form of a database could be a triplet, uh, triplets like these, but how do you build this database? So that of course is a, uh, also a research area and people are still working on this. Uh, so, and the general idea here is, uh, the general problem here is of course called the entity linking problem. So whenever you see uh, two entities, you like to link them. And how would you link, like to link them? You like to link them through some predicate. So here the entity was ICC, the other entity was Australia. They are linked through the predicate current champion. Okay. And of course, to build such a database, you will have to go through more, uh, you have to go through unstructured data. You have to look through passages that people have written. You have to look through documents on the web, look through documents in research papers, depending on your domain, and then try to build the linkage between the two entities. So once you have that linkage, then you can, and given your query, you can then uh, query this database or build a uh, query for this database that can answer your question. Here again, of course, a lot of NLP is involved. For example, I have used the word, uh, the predicate, I have defined the predicate as current champion, right? So for example, in my query, maybe the word that I'm using is winner. So I will have to do a match between winner and current champion. Or in other words, there has to be semantic matching between winner and current champion. So this is again a, uh, you can say a similarity matching problem, which is typically nowadays done through word embeddings or contextual embeddings and cosine similarity. Okay. And of course, 
matching is not only done for the predicate has to also be done for the entities of course usually for the entities disambiguation is much easier so for example australia is always spelled in one way some person's name is always spelled in one way icc would always be written as icc of course icc could also be written in expanded form uh, international cricket uh, i don't know what it stands for council uh, whatever so so it can be written expanded so there also you will have to do a matching so based on these matchings based on whatever your question has asked you search the database and get the answer so the knowledge base Q, qa is done in this way of course at the back end you have to solve the entity linking problem and build the knowledge base if you don't have that already if you have it already then your task is only to devise a good way of searching that database and in that search also it is not exact match it is nlp you still have to do nlp and all the techniques that we have studied previously would still be applied or would have to be applied to get good results okay so that was a quick overview of question answering now so let's quickly move on to conversational agents this is chapter 4 actually chapter 24 of your textbook so you can think of a conversational agent as multiple question answers uh or multiple turns that are taken so you have a question you have a answer or you have some conversation going between two people so so in a way it's kind of an extension of the basic question answering but then of course the scope for conversational agents is much broader so so in general uh we sometimes distinguish between chatbots and dialogue agents although this distinction is not very universal it is common uh, and it's also adopted in the book so chatbots are basically for informal communications or open open dialogue between people meaning that there is no fixed goal so so for example not goal oriented usually chatbots would be such entities or systems that would be used for let's say just entertainment chit chat conversations and so on and then the dialogue agent so this is basically task or goal oriented uh conversational agent so here you have a specific goal maybe you want to book a flight maybe you want to order something from mcdonalds so some specific task so a dialogue agent would help you do that a chatbot is primarily for conversations uh so this distinction is sometimes made and this is also made in the textbook but it's not very common so you need to be aware of it okay so if we talk about chatbots first so generally there are two techniques one is rule based which is the traditional so traditional approach and here the rules primarily are developed by humans of course guided by nlp uh and the rules could be things like uh maybe use regex to find uh, uh currencies for example or find dates uh they might also include uh things like uh, simple uh detection like finding where there is a verb where is a noun 
and then based on the order of the verbs and the nouns, trying to infer what the person is trying to say. Uh, maybe also trying to infer the intent through question marks and through other things, excitement through exclamation marks and so on. So rules are developed for this. Uh, but of course, uh, relying solely on rules is not very extensible and not very robust. So nowadays, we don't rely entirely on rules. So the other approach is called corpus space. So corpus space implies that you are trying to learn uh, chatting or conversations from previously large collect collected collections of chats. So, so here, of course, you can think of, uh, so you can think of, uh, so let's say some call, call center conversation database. So you call the uh, call center, the person replies and there's a communication going on, right? Of course, this would be more, uh, you can say goal oriented or task oriented, but still I'm just trying to give you the idea. So this is like a database. So database can also be obtained from Twitter, for example, Twitter or Facebook or other any other blog or uh, wherever chat, chatting environment that you have on the web. So, and here you tend to learn the interactions between people. If someone has said hello, what is the response that you get? If someone has said, what is your name? What is the response that you get? So in other words, what you're learning here is then basically, and so what is the, the general idea of the model? It will be kind of an encoder, decoder model. And to train this model, you will be using those conversations. So someone has said hello, it will be encoded. And the decoder would be the answer that you would like to get from this hello. Okay? And of course, you will train this over the entire corpus that you have. And usually, you need to have lots of data to do good training. Okay. Of course, uh, in such kind of chatbots, as opposed to question answering, we are not usually only interested in the previous uh, utterance, like hello. We might also be looking at the context behind it. So, so scenarios for incorporating previous context in a neural network are also possible. And to get better conversation, previous context has to be included in a good chatbot, not just the previous question or utterance. And then, uh, of course, most uh, sophisticated chatbots nowadays are hybrid. So they will have some elements of rules, some rules as well, some basic rules, some guidelines also built into the model. And then there will also be some uh, natural language understanding and natural language generation framework that is based on corpus, corpora uh, incorporated in the model. So both of those would be typically be involved. So of course, uh, I don't think so we can discuss in any specific models here. There are several models out there. And then uh, finally, uh, for task oriented, so this was uh, chatbots for dialogue agents, which are for task oriented, uh, conversations. We typically uh, commonly use a frame-based approach. A frame is a basically a knowledge representation uh, structure. 
and uh, so so usually you will have a frame that would capture relevant information for a particular task or domain so for example if you are talking about flight reservation so you will have various uh, you can say slots in the frame so there might be a slot called uh, for example departing city so there might be uh, arrival city depart date depart uh, time also maybe arrive date and so on so these may be slots and then as the conversation agent agents goes through the conversation and gets the information it will fill these slots and in beside each slot there might be some specified questions also so for example for each slot there might be some templates of questions that you can ask from which city are you departing for example so the agent would basically uh fill this knowledge uh representation which is a frame by asking various questions to the other person and if there is anything missing uh of course it will go back and check what whatever is missing and based on what is missing go back and ask the person again to tell that value or information so so here also actually there are a number of things that you need to decide on uh so first of all for example you need to know the domain of the conversation so for example there might be one front end one system but that front end might be used for both flight reservation as well as train reservation or it might be even used for let's say restaurant ordering or table reservation at a restaurant so the first thing that you need to determine once a conversation starts is what is domain of this conversation so again this is a classification problem based on the first few utterances in your conversation so based on the first few utterances you need to classify whether this is restaurant reservation flight reservation or train reservation so this is domain uh classification uh then also there could be various other classification that you can do one other thing is called dialogue act classification so while you are going through the the conversation there may be various dialogue acts and dialogue acts can be defined differently for different applications so one simple dialogue act is if you are asking a question or making a statement so this is also a classification problem so is what is been said a question or a statement but for your various application they might be finer grains of such di dialogue acts and you would like to classify them and based on that classification of course you will make your decisions and uh, filling of the frame so one of those dialogue acts that is somewhat important for is trying to find intent intent classification what is the intent expressed in a particular utterance so for example if we even talk about domain classification so if someone comes into the chat board and say i want to uh, fly to karachi uh, i want to fly to karachi for example so obviously this means that he is uh, interested in booking a flight or let's say if someone comes into the system and says i want to go to dubai again you know that there is no uh train to dubai you only have to fly to dubai so you know that this is a 
द डोमेन इज फ्लाइट रिजर्वेशन ठीक है सो सो वन स्पेसिफिक टाइप ऑफ क्लासिफिकेशन विच कैन बी कॉल्ड ए डायलॉग एक्ट इज इंटेंट क्लासिफिकेशन ठीक है सो वट इज इंटेंट एक्सप्रेस इन द पर्टिकुलर यू कैन से अटरेंस इन ए कम्युनिकेशन और कन्वर्जेशन and this all of these classification typically would be done through neural network through the standard techniques that we have studied previously for nlp uh, using bert or some rnn or lstm and so on and then uh, often time you also need to have a policy policy uh, uh you can say policy uh, model or policy itself is a model so you need to have a policy so how would your agent guide the communication or conversation so so that it's also a part of the entire design some some way of guiding the communication so that you can reach the goal effectively with the with the uh, satisfaction of the user or customer so policy uh can be uh you can say coded but usually this is also a learning process sometimes a reinforcement learning type of framework can be used to update the policy uh, or if there are few updates then it can be pre coded by humans so this is the general idea for a uh, task oriented uh, dialogue agents representation is through frames frames contain uh questions also they contain information that needs to be known they also may contain other helpful hints as well but to fill those slots you need nlp and you need to understand the query the utterance that the other person is saying so all of these dialogue act classification domain classification intent classification and then of course managing the entire conversation through a policy all of these would involve, involve nlp and some of the techniques are, that we have already studied in this course so uh so that was i think a birds eye overview of uh these ideas these ideas did discussed in somewhat more detail in the chapter you can look that up or if you are interested you can also look at some of the uh um, you can say survey papers on chatbots and uh, dialogue agents that have been published in the last one or two years not more than 5 years back because this technology has changed significantly in the last 5 years Uh, there are a couple of good papers in the last one or two years so and of course there are some also tutorials available out there but i think the book chapters are a good starting place it also has a good bibliography so the references are given from where you can look at additional uh, material on the web so i think that is uh, all that i wanted to cover uh, are there any questions so are there any questions no sir i guess koi bhi nahi so i think that is basically brings us to the end of the semester uh i hope you enjoyed uh this entire series of lectures uh
of course, uh, we would have liked to have more time as well to discuss some of these topics in more details. Uh, so, of course, there are also some other topics that we did not touch. I think uh, it would have been useful if we had discussed those slightly. One of them was uh, lexicon based or lexicons for uh, NLP. Uh, and there are specific lexicons for very uh, specific tasks. And the most popular among them are for, are for sentiment classification. The lexicon based sentiment classification is quite popular because it's fast. And, uh, and, and in general, knowledge bases and resources in NLP is a fairly broad area as we had already seen here. So you can build knowledge bases from unstructured text. Uh, building uh, such knowledge bases requires, I think, almost half a semester if you want to study that in detail. So obviously, we don't have that much time in one course in over one semester. So if we ever had a advanced NLP course, so some of these things would typically be covered in that course. Uh, and of course, uh, we do not cover speech in this course. I think there's another course being offered that covers uh, speech. Uh, we primarily focus on text in this course. Uh, 